Fake news has been defined in many ways. Before the 2016 election, the term was already in use by journalists with some frequency, uh, including uh, Silverman, Craig Silverman, who, who wrote in a report that he had prepared for a journalism center, something along the lines of, satirical news websites are built on producing fake takes on real events and trends, but a new breed is emerging. Websites that often don't disclose the fake nature of their content are engaged in satirical commentary, etc. Instead, they turn out fake articles designed and written to present as real news. They do it to generate traffic and shares and collect avenue, ad revenue as a result. Now, as you can tell from this accounting, this was prior to the, uh, what we might say is the, the political weaponization of this technology, and it was, it was a fairly narrow conceptualization of what fake news meant. As time has gone by, fake news has taken on other meanings. So some scholars have tried to stay close to this original uh, idea that it's news that looks like real news, but isn't. Uh, for example, as our and colleagues write, it's fabricated information that mimics news media content in form, but not in organizational process or intent. Fake news outlets, in turn, lack the news media's editorial norms and processes for ensuring the accuracy and credibility of information. Fake news overlaps with other information disorders, such as misinformation, which is false or misleading, and disinformation, false information that is purposely spread to deceive people. All right, so again, we still have fake news grounded in this notion that it is information that purports to be the product of a traditional news outlet, but in fact is not. What we find, though, is that as the term achieves uh, popular uh, usage following the 2016 election, its meanings rapidly diverge. We have people who now use fake news. Uh, well, here, I'll read one critique. Uh, so, sometimes the, the, the articulations are very broad. For example, uh, Alcott and Genskow simply say, news articles that are intentionally and verifiably false that could mislead readers. Okay, well, this is a form of deceptive practice of messaging that is clearly inaccurate and done so intentionally, but it's actually a, a much broader articulation than was originally intended with the notion of fake news. Um, Ethan Zuckerman critiques that articulation. He says, actually he says, of fake news in general. It's a vague and ambiguous term that spans everything from false balance, actual news that doesn't deserve our attention, Propaganda, which he describes as weaponized speech designed to support one party over another, and disinformation, information designed to sow doubt and increase mistrust in institutions. And to that, we can add the uses that we've seen by the president, which is to say fake news is merely a blunt bludgeon with which to hit anything you don't like, anything that criticizes your point of view, criticizes your actions or your administration's actions. It is used sometimes sloppily as an indication of this is a biased outlet, this is an outlet that expresses a view that I don't agree with. All right, so that's the, the landscape of critiques of the term and how it's been understood. And then there are some alternatives that have been put forth, but before I talk about those. Do you all want to weigh in on the... Sure, yeah. Um, I think as you... Can you hear me? Hello? I think it is like a real minefield in terms of, like, this is an area that has got really hot really quickly. And before, I think, the 2016 election, there was like, like, I think misinformation on fake news research was actually quite small. And I think because of the circumstances, it has just blown up. And I feel like also with the slow publication cycle, we haven't had the time to kind of for almost the literature to settle on what this frame actually even means. And I think there's a lot of people trying to define it, and there's a lot of people in this space, but I think, as, as you pointed out, it, it's really ended up in this really fuzzy space of, um, I think each paper is going to have to really specify what they actually mean. And I think that, you know, is probably a good thing. I think in all fields we have to clarify, be very clear, but I think particularly this one, I mean, it's, it's very complicated now. <laughs> 
Right, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that, it, this is the first, you know, going around like both of you and talking about this around the world recently, this is the first thing that, that comes up every time is we have to clarify what we're talking about, and rightly so. And as you say, this is not unfamiliar, right? Uh, when new research areas start, the first thing that you try to do is to clarify what it is that you're thinking about. For myself, I try nowadays just to, to like a lot of the folks that were, Kelly was talking about, I try to just um, avoid the term, actually. I tend to use the term information pollution, which, it, like fake news, is, uh, is a wide scope term, but usefully so, I think. So when I, th I think about a, uh, information pollution, what I mean is information, toxic information, that's been, as it were, dumped into the media environment uh, or spread or disseminated within that environment. And by toxic, I mean information that can either be, could be false, that's one way of being toxic, it could be true but misleading, or it could be just not based on any evidence at all or linked to any evidence. And there's a variety of other ways as well. But those three phenomena are particularly, I think, interesting, and, and Kelly's already touched on them. I also like the term information pollution because the metaphor encourages us to think about uh, the environment in general in which we are uh, operating, in, both in social media, in the general traditional news media, and in our, you know, in our daily life exchanging information. Um, that, that environment, uh, like any environment, can be uh, <laughs> uh, manipulated, uh, it can be uh, corrupted, and it can be polluted. And we can think about ourselves and those who are acting on the environment as having some responsibility for it. And we can talk about that as we go on. So, not to spend too much time on definitions, but since we all seem to be in agreement that this is useful to understand what we're talking about here, I would add that for me, the question as a researcher is what we gain from the boundaries that we set on each of these terms. So if we are going to study fake news, why is it important to bound it in precisely that way? So there are some other terms. Um, there is, for example, in addition to the ones you've just described, we have, um, there has been some interest in describing this as, as um, uh, well, we have, we have terms like information disorder, which is a broader category, not unlike pollution, which is a, the notion that there are a variety of ways in which the information environment can go wrong, can be misleading. And then within that, we can have various subtypes. And in among the subtypes that I find most compelling, well, first, there is a very long history of literature on rumor. And rumor is simply conceptualized as claims with a lack of a secure standard of evidence. So if I tell you something without offering evidence to support it, that's a rumor. It's not necessarily false, but rumors can be used to achieve political ends, to be politically manipulative, and they are often false. Okay, so, so you have that notion. You have the notion of mis- and disinformation. So misinformation when something is untrue, disinformation when it is intentionally untrue with a particular goal of obscuring the information environment of, as uh, was previously noted, creating uncertainty about the institutions with which we by which we, we come to understand the world. So if you introduce a lot of competing truths, people will potentially eventually throw up their hands and say, how can I know? There's no one I can trust. Everyone says something different. There is no truth out there. And it was very disheartening to me as someone who's been studying this for a decade in the wake of the 2016 election to have friends and family coming up to me and saying those words literally, verbatim, like, I give up. There's no way for me to know what's true. And in response to that, my answer is, no, no, there is, actually, there is a reality out there. Don't give up. So coming back to fake news, my question, and, I don't, and I'd like to hear what my colleagues think about this, is what exactly do we gain by focusing on news that 
presents itself as though it were a, a produced by a traditional news organization, but is not. So when we have falsehoods that are masquerading as a traditional news outlet's product, what do we gain from placing that boundary and studying that as a unique entity that we don't get from looking at the ideas of misinformation, disinformation, and rumor, for instance? I, in some ways, I think there is a case to be made that there's something unique about information that presents itself as belonging to the news institutions. But in many ways, I think that the, the insights that we generate from trying to understand how people respond to a sometimes ambiguous and always complicated media environment, um, we, we can, I think there are more similarities between the different types of falsehoods that circulate than there are differences. And I worry that by bounding fake news so tightly, we may actually end up obscuring or, or overlooking important parallels. I think that's a fantastic point. And I think like a, perhaps one example would be like if, you're, if you stick uh, strictly to some of these definitions, it can become not as useful for researchers. For example, if you're um, trying to track, say, a rumor or a piece of misinformation through um, a social network, if, you, if it starts off by being disinformation and spread with like intent to deceive, but then someone you know, gets this misinformation or this piece of disinformation and then shares it, but thinking it's true, it, does that become misinformation then? You know, it, it's, I think that it's, it's only um, could be relevant or useful in certain academic or even social settings. But I think we do have to be careful about like, bounding its, its usefulness. Um. Yeah, I, I agree, and that's why, actually, I like to focus more on that term that I was talking about, for just those reasons. I mean, I would throw another term out there, which I think is important to put on the table, which also has a long history of, 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 of study by all sorts of people, uh, and that is propaganda. Uh, propaganda is, um, is as wildly defined, widely defined, and differently defined as fake news. Uh, in fact, it has the same plasticity nowadays. But <clears throat> it also has an interesting history in that uh, it, it, it has been used in a, in a self-conscious way <laughs> by various governments. Uh, in fact, governments that have had official ministers of propaganda. Um, and one of those ministers of propaganda, uh, Goebbels, uh, said that one of the ironies of, he thought, of 1930s uh, German democracy before it became not a democracy or 1920s democracy was that he said isn't it ironic that the tools of the, the ideals of democracy rather were the very things that brought it down and what he mean by what I'm paraphrasing what he meant by that was that the very idea that information should be allowed to spread uh, freely, that it should be produced in, from different per points of view, uh, that we should have protections on speech. These things can be used by actors with bad intent, like himself, <laughs> to uh, uh, corrupt those very ideals. And that's, in fact, one of the chief ways that propaganda, and indeed things like fake news, can work. They can work precisely because they're in an environment that perceives itself to be unpolluted or free or bounded or protected by rules, but in fact can be manipulated and corrupted uh, because of the perception that it is in some, some sense purer than it is. And I think that's, um, uh, that's a lesson for me in thinking about what's happening now. And it's a lesson that comes from thinking about the history of propaganda. Just to touch on that, if I sure. could. Um, I, yeah, totally um, agree. And I think that even if we settle on a definition, it's really important to, to, to try and gauge like cutoffs. And I feel like, you know, that <clears throat> with everything that is a continuum, it's important to know like, well, where do you draw that line? Where do you actually, how do you define it? And I think we can probably take some inspiration from a lot of different fields like, you know, medicine or psychology that have also wrestled with cutoffs for such a long time. Sure. You know, things like, you know, 
depression or anxiety, like when is it clinically relevant? Like when does this become actually, if we say fake news, or when does it become fake news? Um, and I think even now there's some, um, I was like, I think reading on the way, they changed the definition of the cutoff for high blood pressure last year. And it was incredibly controversial because apparently now 46% of like, you know, Amer the American adult population has high blood pressure. But I think where you draw that line really matters. And I think this is probably like a wider discussion like in the future. For yeah, I think that we also see that Facebook is wrestling with where we draw the line, right? Fake news, um, if we were going to, we've been, I started by saying it's an awfully narrow concept considering the history of this literature and this scholarship, but in fact, we can further subdivide it, right? Uh, Wardle uh, has, has noted there are a variety of categories of things that we call fake news. We have satire or parody, we have misleading content, we have imposter content, fabricated content, content that makes false connections or provides false context, and manipulated content. So Facebook is trying to figure out, well, which of these do we go after? Because we can't actually go after every type of falsehood that circulates. Like sometimes people say things that aren't true because they don't know any better. Sometimes it's just an accident. So, and Facebook has pointed out that with all the focus on text messages and content that masquerades as serious news, maybe we should be more concerned about memes because these are graphical objects with text laid on top of them that are very difficult for machines to process automatically and which can often be um, widely shared, very evocative and therefore very tempting to, uh, to circulate. And as a consequence, even though they don't have the sort of credentials that a a claim that seems to be coming from the news does, they're still influential. They still move people to feel angry or upset or afraid, and they convey ideas that, while not grounded in um, any sense of concrete, I have evidence for this, there's still a, a sense of, well, I don't know if it's true, but I just feel like it's important. So, I, <clears throat> so one of the things that um, that I think you, Kelly's bringing up is the fact that a lot of what we we do online is share things, and some of those things are linguistic in structure, and some of them are visual. But uh, one, one of the things that I think is important when we think about what we're doing online is to think about what the function of those acts, what, what what function does um, the act of sharing a news story, for example, have, or a meme? So on the surface, when I, sh when I share a news story uh, online, or you know, I, sh I share something you know, that I've read, or perhaps not read, um, what's, it seems like on the surface what I'm doing, I may even feel that what I'm doing, primarily, is trying to give some people information. I may be recommending something, I'm endorsing it, or I'm actually just asserting it. I'm just claiming this is the case. So I'm acting in what philosophers, I'm a philosopher, uh, tend to call an act of testimony. I'm testifying to something. It looks like that's what I'm doing. It feels like what I'm doing. I often think that's not at all what we're doing. Uh, and that fact that we're, we're unaware of that we might be doing something else is a really crucial thing to, I think, to understand. So what else might we be doing? Well, a clue that we're not doing what we think we're doing often, not all the time, but often, when we're sharing things online, a clue is the recent research that has shown that something that a lot of you will surprise none of you, actually, which is that most people don't read the things that they share. And by most people, I mean most people, most of the time, do not read and even look at the things that they share. They've read the headline, presumably, uh, but they have not read. In fact, a, uh, a high-ranking Facebook executive who has full, de full deniability on this told me at an event at the National Press Club that their own internal data shows that up to 90%, which is way higher than any other data I've seen, uh, of people uh, aren't sharing, I mean, aren't reading what they share. That's an incredibly high number. He said, we'll never release the data because, duh, it undermines our business model. And he said, yeah, you can talk about it, but you know, even if you mention my name, which I won't, uh, 
he says it's full deniability. That's a rumor, I guess. I'm not giving you any evidence. But there is data out there. So, I mean, people aren't, aren't reading what they share. And how do we react to things uh, on Facebook, for example? We react emotionally. In fact, we're prompted to do so by little smiley face, happy, you know, frowny face, outraged face, et cetera. Those two facts alone, that we don't read and we react emotionally, suggest to me that the primary function of sharing things online is to express emotions, to express tribal emotions often. I mean, and I'm talking not sharing cat pictures or pictures of your kids, I'm talking about items with political content. So the primary function of this communicative act is not what we think it is. That's a very interesting thing because when we engage in a systematic acts of communication, that we think are do and we think we're doing one thing, but we're actually doing another. People who do recognize that, who recognize that, that we are actually not aware of what we're doing, that is a very powerful bit of recognition. People actually start to, you know, when you can, if you're a propagator of false news propaganda or some, something like that, recognizing that other people aren't aware of what they're doing makes them easier to manipulate. I also think compounding that, um, there was the, the science paper a couple of months ago that showed that fake news spread faster than, than real news, and yeah. they, they looked into um, perhaps what could be behind this, and they found that on, with, with all like the base, they measured like the base emotions, and they found that out of all of those, it was um, perhaps motivated by surprise and disgust. Yeah. Um, I thought it was incredibly interesting, probably because one of my best friends at grad school is a disgust ex like expertise, like that that she's a researcher that just focuses on disgust, which I think is brilliant. That's that's, that's a cool thing it's to focus super on. Super right? cool. <laughs> um, but I asked her when this finding, I, I you know, it's like very new. You know, I think it definitely needs to be replicated. We need to actually experiment with this to actually see whether it really is the, the case. But what she said was, well, disgust is an excellent tool for um, in-group, out-group divisiveness. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, this, this, this <laughs> makes sense. It makes a lot of yeah, sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely something that we, we need to find out if it's the case and if we can do anything about it. So. Right. So we circle around here the question of how Facebook are influential, uh, sorry, how fake news might be influential. And this is a question that will be talked about more over the course of the day. But I think one question that's worth surfacing right now has to do with a distinction hinted at here between when people are signaling a belief and when they are signaling an identity. And we tend to talk about those things as being fundamentally different. If I say, I have this political identity, I belong to this group, that's very different than saying, I believe in this, I don't believe in that. And yet, when we watch how people engage in political content online, it's not clear to me that those things are actually as different as they appear to be. I think in many instances, they are difficult for the individual engaged in the action to separate. So to be clear, I am not suggesting, as some scholars have, that when people share content that isn't true, they are simply engaging in partisan cheerleading. That's one possibility. Maybe you're sharing that, that nasty story about the candidate you don't like, not because you think it's true, but just because you want to make that candidate look bad and you're willing to do anything in order to achieve that end. Okay, that probably happens once in a while. But my sense is that most people don't think particularly clearly about this kind of distinction. We encounter something that says, awful things about someone who is in the out group and it feels true, not because we consciously weigh the evidence, but because we naturally have an animosity towards or distrust of the out group. And so I think that often the distinction that scholars sensibly want to make between identity and belief is actually not as clear cut in people's minds, in people's experiences. To, to draw just momentarily on some of the work that I've been doing recently, we were manipulating people's sense of group belonging or exclusion. Some individuals, we specifically um, 
induced a sense of being left out, of being shunned by a group. Now, it wasn't a group they had any particular close association with. It was a very weak manipulation in some ways. We basically just, we had them create a profile of themselves and then share it with a group of other people. And in one condition, their profile was liked a lot. And in the other condition, their profile wasn't liked very much at all. If you've ever been on Facebook, this is what you experience, right? You share something and your content gets positive feedback or it doesn't. So every day we are experiencing social exclusion. Every day we're putting content out into the world via social media and we're being told, hey, you're one of us, or no, you're not. Now the interesting thing that we found is that when we induced people into this exclusion condition, they became more likely to endorse the falsehoods that were associated with their party. Democrats became more likely to say that things that Democrats are supposed to believe were true, and Republicans were more likely to claim their falsehoods. So it's an important, there, there is a distinction, right? Identity and beliefs are not exactly the same thing, but there's something really interesting going on in this relationship between emotion and group identity and beliefs, and I think it's a mistake to say that it's just people doing a symbolic act I don't think we want to claim that when people share falsehoods and they know evidence to the contrary, they're being strategically deceptive. I don't think that's right. I think that people are being honest about what they believe, even if they aren't being rational about what they believe. So uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, and particularly about this, this, and we've nicely focused it on when we're sharing information that we, in a sense, know that or we have evidence to think uh, is not true. Um, I think one one point that Kelly brings is bringing to the fore for for myself, and this is my way of putting it. Uh, is the role that conviction, what I'd call conviction, can play uh, in our online life and what uh, our social media platforms can do to turn beliefs into conviction. By conviction, I mean here uh, a belief that one sees as constitutive of one's self-identity. So a, not just any old belief. Uh, okay, you know, it's not it's not just two plus two equals four, I believe that. Uh, and I think it's necessarily true. Uh, but <laughs> uh, it can't be false, for example. But that doesn't mean it's a conviction. I don't have, saying two plus two equals four is not, you know, I have the courage of my convictions. That, that's not a conviction. A conviction is a belief that is, is part of my identity. And one of the things that, one of the reasons I think that you're right, that this, there is a, uh, that belief and identity are often not far apart uh, online is because our social media platforms, for some of the reasons that we've already talked about, have to our, we might put them, our conviction machines. They, they, they're good ways to turn mere beliefs or even guesses into convictions. And how do they do that? Well, by encouraging us to express, um, uh, express ourselves emotionally about the content that is being placed online and to express ourselves emotionally in ways that lean us to in and out group sorting behavior. No, totally. And um, I feel like um, it's also important to, to look at who, who is, like if we actually look at this as a whole, like who is doing the spreading of fake news and who yeah. is being exposed to fake news. Um, and some work that um, we've been doing in the laser lab has tried to look at this, particularly in regards to the 2016 election. And it turns out not everyone is being exposed and shared at the same amount. We, we and I think this is where the distinction comes in between, like, if you're not looking at, like, hyperpartisan stuff, but we, we try to label it as, like, these, on the domain level, these, these sites that, like, appear to be um, spreading, yeah, fake news. And we found that, on the whole, it was about 5%, but if you just look at that number, it does not tell the whole story. We found that, in terms of exposures who saw fake news, 1% um, saw 80% of the, the fake news out there. 
And in terms of sharing, it was even more extreme. It was 0.1% shared 80% of the fake news. And I, I think that this is a, a message that, you know, I, we, we think of it as this big global issue, but in actual fact, it could be like a couple of people. We called them super sharers, and it was really, it was quite extraordinary. We have to, again, look at this on a, a bigger a bigger sample, but I mean, it, it, it's really concentrated. Um, and we found, you know, on the whole, who, who is being exposed and sharing was, you know, um, a lot of older adults as well. And I think knowing who the people are, and maybe we can start to do something about it. That's, that's really interesting data. I mean, one of the things that we've, uh, I've been talking, going on about is just the general environment. And that environment can be corrupted in the ways that we've, we've been just talking about. Uh, that makes it, it, it makes it sort of a comfortable environment <laughs> in which to, for a tiny fraction of people, to be spreading uh, these, these stories, which can have a re, uh, repercussions beyond just, uh, let's say, believing the content or, or uh, emotionally reacting to that content. But it's really interesting to, um, to hear about the percentages of people that, and you're interested in just to ask, you're, you're thinking about domains, you were tracking domains that were uh, linked to, let's say, the Internet Research Agency, yeah. uh, so the so Russian. So it's, yeah. it's times like these you can tell like how definitions really matter. Right. So in our case, fake news was we, we took these pre-existing lists from a lot of journalists and previous academic right. work of, of what they thought was, was um, fake news, but we also, we, we almost had like three different definitions, and we tried to measure them along all of these to check that at right. least on the whole, we could like, for a robustness, like uh, are these being replicated? Um, we also um, did some hand labeling ourselves to see whether we could actually say which was, you know, what, what is fake news and, and what isn't. We look for things like, um, does, the, does this website have um, um, actual journalists saying, you know, that they wrote the article? Do if you Google these people, do they have you know degrees of journalism? Um, uh, do, does this website actually elicit fact checks? You know, because so, you know fake news sites, they they you know everything's correct. Like they're not going to actually put something out there to say they're wrong. So I think these kind of things can give us clues. But I think we're we're all just trying to figure it out. Right. So I think we have pivoted usefully towards questions about how the technology has changed these social media platforms in particular, but other aspects of the internet as well, have changed the way that misinformation functions, the way that it circulates, the influence that it has. And we have, I think right now, been focusing a bit on the, the technological attributes. And, and I would point out that the fact that a tiny fraction of people are sharing a vast majority of this content, and yet this content has generated national headlines. So a tiny number of people have managed to move the entire spotlight, both in terms of the news media's attention to this fake news phenomenon, but also hundreds of scholars and millions of dollars are all now directed by virtue of the actions of 0.1% of people in, in one sample. That suggests to me that this is a system very vulnerable to gaming. If you want to exploit a system, find one that is highly responsive to the actions of just a few individuals, mm -hmm. and then insert your individuals and have them take those actions. So there is a, I think, there is a vulnerability being revealed through uh, observations like this. But the, the second point I want to make is that it is not sufficient to focus on the technology and the attributes that we associate with these technologies because there are very important social norms and conventions that go along with how people behave in these different communities that shape how the technologies get used. So if we say, well, social media make it more likely that people are going to share falsehoods than they are to share truths, as we saw in the Twitter data that was reported in Science uh, well, going on a year ago now, six months anyway, um, that is probably an overstatement because there are a whole lot of different social media type environments and different social media environments, different platforms have different communities of users and those communities of users function in different ways. So compare Reddit to Twitter. 
these are two not equally used, but too widely used. There are millions of Americans who use each of these platforms. Um, I would suggest that the behaviors, the types of sharing, the types of interactions that you will see around claims are going to be very different. And it's in part about the attributes. Twitter is limited to short messages. Twitter is more about broadcasting to a crowd than it is about engaging in a back and forth kind of conversation than Reddit is. But even if you limit yourself to just what's happening in Reddit, there are different conversa conversation spaces, different subreddits, where we see very different behaviors around truths and falsehoods. In one subreddit, a truth may fi fly faster than a falsehood, whereas in another, the falsehood may travel farther. These are important distinctions, and we have to be careful not to reduce it all to claims about the technology made me do it. Fair enough. Uh, we might also mention there are other domains too, which uh, like 4chan, for example, um, and uh, there are there are other e d even darker corners of the political internet, uh, as I'm sure many of you here are aware of, and 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 that I suppose just reinforces Kelly's point that that we can't really blame per, per se technology, although I think we can blame. Uh, a lot of our behavior on that technology. I'm one of the, I, I tend to think that what really matters is what we do with it. There's nothing intrinsic to, I think, the technology per se, um, but there is uh, something about human beings that when we're using this technology, uh, tends to bring out sometimes, uh, particularly in matters political, not our best sides. Uh, and. Sometimes it's the case that the people who are particularly gr motivated towards uh, the darker, uh, darker political ends can find platforms where they can congregate. Um, sometimes those people will just act on the wider uh, political platforms like Facebook. Um, but for me, the, I, I think Kelly's point that there are social, cultural, ethical norms that are important to concentrate on and might be being violate it, manipulate it, um, or otherwise ignored or abused, <laughs> uh, that's a point that, as a philosopher, I think is extremely important for us to recognize. Um, and it harkens back to the point that I mentioned at the beginning, that <clears throat> propaganda gen generally works in a democracy by exploiting the very ideals of that democracy. That's how it works. And I think in a lot of cases, that's how the tiny fraction of people that are exploiting Facebook, for example, uh, are making, uh, having as much success as they are. Yeah, I think um, the internet has changed things substantially, actually, um, for a number of reasons. I think firstly, for confirmation bias. So that's when you, know, you look for information that um, agrees with your pre-existing views. And I think now we have like so much a quantity, not necessarily quality, of information that you can literally find anything that you want if you put in the correct search terms. So I think that really has changed um, people's ability to confirm their own biases. Uh, and secondly, as you, you mentioned, I think that people, just the fact that they're able to find other people with those exact same uh, misperceptions is, is actually um, very powerful. Because I think, you know, previously without internet, you'd be like, you know, the one person in the village with these like bizarre misconceptions and be, yeah, yeah, you'd be the one crazy person in the village and you right. wouldn't, but now all the crazy people in the village have the same village thread. They yeah, <laughs> they, village. well, they've got this online and I, I actually think that, you know, we are, we know that people gauge how valid their perceptions are based upon you know, their interaction with others. And we know that also people like um, highly overestimate if you ask people how many other people do you think holds this misperception, they'll often say like, ah, oh, 50%, and if you tell them it's actually like 2%, they will be incredibly surprised. But I, I, I think that the internet's really playing to these vulnerabilities. Especially given people's tendency to neglect the denominator. We actually aren't very good at percentages. If I say, I know there are 100 people who believe me, versus I know there are 100,000 people who believe me, that matters a lot to me, like it's, it's, I'm much more convinced if there are 100,000 people. It doesn't matter 
how many the largest population is. So is it 100,000 in 7 billion? Because then it's actually not that impressive. Like, yeah, there are a lot of people who agree with me, but there's still a tiny fraction of the world. They may all be crazy. But I think that people aren't all that good at paying attention to that denominator. And so when they go online and they find the people they agree with, they're like, oh, look, look at all these people who believe me which is a much easier position than be that one lone person who holds a view. And I think this is an opportunity to point out that we do not have to be isolated from more accurate information to maintain our belief in inaccurate behaviors and inaccurate things. So th this notion that we could fix this misinformation problem if we could just educate people. If we could just open their eyes, expose them to the truth, then magically everyone would see the light, the good information would, would float to the top inevitably. I think that experiment has been done. We know that's not true. Like, we don't need, the reason that people believe things that aren't true, it's not because they exist in these insular echo chambers. It is not because, and by echo chamber, let me be specific about what I mean. I mean a room or an environment in where you never hear the other side. This is how the notion of an echo chamber was originally articulated. You couldn't count on seeing any other view but your own. Well, that notion of an echo chamber doesn't really exist. We have a lot of empirical evidence that shows that people do encounter other viewpoints. The thing is, they encounter their own viewpoints more often because of this confirmation bias. And in my view, that's enough. It's enough to know that your side is the one you see more often. Because then you can say, well, sure, there's disagreement. But most people believe what I believe. Most of the arguments that I know support what I think. And so, when we ask people, well, why do you believe that? And give them evidence that they might be wrong. We get all kinds of responses. Sometimes people will count arguments. Sometimes they'll offer other kinds of things. But you know, sometimes they'll just say, hey, you know, I'm not as smart as you. But I know someone who's as smart as you, and they say it's true. Sometimes they'll say, look, I don't need to have this debate. Let's just talk about something else. But I know what's true, and you're just trying to trick me. Sometimes they'll say, you know, this is, you're making it too complicated. It's really much simpler. It's just human beings work in a world that is way too complicated for us to weigh all the evidence all the time. We have to take stuff on faith. We have to use shortcuts. And both of those things mean that sometimes it's just going to come down to what do you believe? And Bring me back around to the second chamber idea. What I believe can be strongly informed by who are my people and do I have access to those people? Can I find my people and are they going to stand back? As long as I can find those people, bring it on. You know, I, you can bring on someone who said yes. <laughs> I will go and I will look. In fact, there's good evidence that people who are feeling um, politically vulnerable will actually go out and look at the other side. My candidate's about to lose, well, I better understand what that opponent thinks and does. Not because I think I'm going to be convinced that my opponent is the better choice, but because I want to be ready. You know, this is, this is opposition research. People engage in this. Climate skeptics, climate change deniers, they're often very knowledgeable about the climate science evidence that's out there. So I, I think one one uh, I think that would be I think a ton of interesting uh, things that have just come out that I think are going to be important for us to talk about during uh, the whole day. I think for any one of the points that we've come out is the massive one of the things that's changed is the amount of uh, information that we have access to to carry out the whole world we have in our pockets. Uh, but I would say that something there's in fact, well, let me just rip on that a little bit. It used to be, in fact, that we comment on that quite a bit. Someone of my age, I remember when the internet first started. And one of the things that there were a lot of books that came out about 12 years ago, 
50 years ago that were, oh, we're being overwhelmed, we're, we're drowning under a sea of information, and people my age would worry about, oh, our God, that's too much, we better know. But now he's not really worried about that anymore. We have actually access to way even more information than we did 50 years ago. But we're not worried about it that as I think existentially I think disagree with you over the Um and the reason for that I think is because the internet gets us not just more information, it gets us the information that we want and we are totally cut down to the three about combination lines. And that's the important distinction. It's not just more information. Remember, for some of us who are old enough, you can remember before there was Google. When you would search on the internet, and you would just get this sort of haystack of stuff. It would be like it wouldn't be. I know this is hard for you to imagine. You've only been out of Google, but you would just you would type in something, and you just get like random things that would sort of maybe somebody might think was related to, to what you were searching. <coughs> and that was what it seemed really overwhelming because you had to scroll through all this stuff. And you would look for all the ask genes, and you would scroll through just testing to see. Um, and you'd scroll through and you'd try to look for what you want. But nowadays, look at the app. The apps are the ones just get us the information that we want. They get us, and that's great. And how does that work? How does the magic happen? The magic happens because the internet is personalized. Everything we do, everything we uh, click on, is tracked by the platforms that we're engaging with. Each of us right now, with phones in our pockets, are leaving a, a, a trail of ones and zeros, as it were, uh, out into the internet. Because all of our phones right now are engaged in, in a sense, tracking us. And that's, you know, actually that's really great because in certain ways, because when you're shopping, it's great when you're shopping for shoes that the internet is so personalized. Because you think about you think about some shoes, maybe you, you look at a shoe on Amazon, and then you don't buy anything, but you know, the next day on the New York Times, the shoes are there. Or shoes like them. Or a lot of shoes like them. Or maybe this just the shoes you were actually looking for, but you didn't find initially. They come around. So it's great. The personalized internet is great for shopping for shoes. What it's not great for is shopping for facts. Because when you find the facts that are just tailored to fit your preferences, that's when you find yourself reinforced. Maybe not in an echo chamber, but you find yourself reinforced. So it's, it's the way that the technology is built that for, to satisfy human desire for capital, <laughs> essentially, it's how the internet makes its money that feeds into the construction confirmation bias. So there we see technology and our values coming together and conspiring together, I suppose, to lead to this sort of corrupted information environment. Yeah, and I just think that the reality is, like, even if you're not actively looking for anything, we're just exposed to so much that um, you don't have the, the time, the motivation, or the cognitive resources to actually do a fact check on everything. And I think that, you know, it, it, you have to be very motivated in order to do a proper fact check. And I just think this is where kind of the trust and source comes into right. it. Because you know, you're, you're just effectively, like no one can be an expert on everything. Like even people that believe in climate change, we're just, we put our trust in the climate scientists. It's, it's not that we have done the research ourselves. And I think that when it comes to your own personal expertise, it's so limited um, that I think fostering the trust in like good sources compared to bad is you know, quite an important. Um, Facet. So I think we have been asked to leave lots of time for interaction with the audience. And while I think we all probably have more to say because we care about this topic very deeply, we should turn it out to all of you to give you a chance to help steer this conversation. Are there things that you would like to ask us or like us to talk about? Yeah. 
I, I think, you know, that, I, I think well, that resonates with me that we, selling facts is, uh, one sells emotional connection. And uh, certain platforms, uh, and uh, one with, begins with an F, <laughs> does in fact uh, sell, identify itself as connecting people. It's, they're not connecting people, they don't see themselves as connecting people uh, uh, in, in the way that a library does. They, they see themselves as connecting the people emotionally. That's why they have emoticons as the way to prompt you to re respond to each other emotionally. Uh, but, and that's fine. Emotional connection is a good thing in life. Um, it's just unfortunate that sometimes people don't realize that they're connecting emotionally. Uh, sometimes they think they're doing something else. And that's when we're vulnerable. When we think we're doing one thing, but we're actually doing another. Because somebody who, do, who, who sees the situation clearly can take advantage of us right then. That's why, that's how, for example, uh, why used car salesmen uh, <laughs> have such a bad rap. Because they often do see that people have emotional connections to objects. Uh, yeah, that I don't know. Um, I don't actually think there is. I don't think there's anything. I think, uh, so uh, confirmation bias and motivated reasoning are very powerful. But I don't think there's anything that makes us genetically uh, predisposed to misinformation yeah. as itself. Um, again, motivated, no, this is very, very tricky. Um, and it's a few things. So I think no one wants to be deceived and no one likes to believe in inaccurate information per se. Um, so most of my research, I'm a cognitive psychologist and most of my research is um, uh, about how people actually respond to corrective information. And I think actually people do a fantastic job when they're presented with corrections on the whole. Um, I don't think people, like there, we do have what's called the continued influence effect of misinformation where people, even after correction, like the, the inaccurate information still continues to influence your, your memory, your judgment, your reasoning. But that's, I think, a very different matter than wanting to believe in inaccurate things. I think if that thing fits with your pre-existing views, that, that is a different thing, but I don't think there's anything. I also feel like people, um, you bring up entertainment. I think people are really terrible at distinguishing between um, a, like truth on like TV shows and entertainment and truth in the real world. People have done experiments, people are like horrible at separating these. Actually, I've had it like, to do my research, I often have a whole bank of like myths and facts and it's made me actually very good at pub quiz. <laughs> um, but like one of one of the actual um, stimuli that I used in my PhD is is you know, it's really gross. But it's do, do you guys know the um, the whole if you pee on a jellyfish sting it'll make it better? Yeah, there's some nods there. Do you know that came from a 1997 episode of Friends? <laughs> that is not and, like, like most deep truth. <laughs> like, right. like most deep friends, it comes from either Friends or The Simpsons. But like. In my retraction, like I say this, it comes from friends and it will make your day like even worse than it already is because I'm sure there's been some people that have followed through, but it's a very <laughs> strongly held belief in popular culture. And we just don't, I mean, the thing with that particular misconception is that they referenced a reputable source. They were like, oh, on the natural history channel, or the biology channel, whatever, I don't know the channels here because I'm Australian, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah. That's a really roundabout way to say. I would like to see that. Do they? Do they really? Well, I, I mean, I, I will pick the, the statistics that I'm familiar with that I always find striking is that um, one in four people, I think at this point, it's probably about one in four on the planet. Certainly one in four in the US and one in three in some, I think in, in Russia, say that the, the sun goes around the earth. One in four. That's a pretty big number to me. I mean, like I, when I first encountered that, I thought, no way. Like, you're just, that can't possibly be. But look at it, and it goes up, and it goes, <laughs> it goes away for a while, and it comes back. But a bunch of these people will also tell you, without qualm, well, yeah, sure, I know what the scientists say. I went to school. 
I know that they say there's evidence for it, but it's not true. So it's not as simple as ignorance. And it's not, I don't think, as simple as wanting to believe it. I think they truly are trying to make the best judgment. Um, all right, so I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to pivot to this question of how people respond to corrections, because I've, I've also done a bunch of work on corrections. And I think that it's a really fascinating area to do work, because on the one hand, it, um, it's not as bad as we've been led to believe. I think Brendan Nyhan did some really compelling work um, that got a lot of people excited. He found that when you showed people corrections, their views became less accurate. So I will admit, when I first read that, I felt some skepticism because I'd already been doing some work in this area and it just didn't resonate. And I immediately started trying to replicate in a variety of ways using data I'd already collected and data that was going to be collected, and I could never reproduce it. And I thought, okay, it's not, so, so this backfire effect, I wasn't seeing evidence, and, and now I can say with much more confidence, other people have done much thorough, much more thorough attempts to reproduce that effect. This notion that your worldview is going to dominate your beliefs and that you will see a correction and actively reinforce, you know, entrench in your own view when you encounter a correction, it's not as simple as that. Now, so that's good news. But the bad news is people are very, their, their responsiveness to corrective information is very small. So it doesn't generally produce a reinforcement effect, but it doesn't generally have a big effect either. And this is not um, altogether bad. I mean, if we updated our beliefs every time someone came along and told us something different, we would be um, highly manipulable, right? If I walked up to you and said, oh no, the sun, it does in fact go around the earth, and you immediately updated your beliefs, that would be problematic. So we have a lot of good reasons to be resistant to information that doesn't feel right. Resistant to information that's hard to make sense of. It just doesn't fit within the, the current way we have of understanding our world. It doesn't line up with the prior evidence. So in some ways, this is, it could be a product of a rational process. I know a lot that supports what I already think. I've spent my life trying to figure out what I already think. And now here you come along and tell me, well, here's this one other piece of evidence. I'm not likely to update based on that alone. But we have good evidence that it's not just rational. Because even if we create these falsehoods, we make up the information, we make up the falsehood. No one's ever seen it before, so they don't have a deep base of knowledge on which to base it. And then we try and correct it. We say, hey, you know that, that fact we just told you? Made it up. Well, people still act as though it were true. Even if they acknowledge, okay, it's not true, but I'm just going to work as though it were. Like, it's a topic very close to my heart because I spent probably three quarters of my PhD trying to elicit a backfire effect um, to see whether it existed. I did all the right circumstances to see. So effectively, there are, there are in the literature widely like there's like two general backfire effects. The first, like they 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 result in the same thing. It means that you know people go the, the opposite way. They believe more in the misconception rather than less. But there are two kind of mechanisms. Um, the first is this worldview, which is where people like you know really identify. They hold this this belief strongly, and because of reasons of uh, um, yeah, they 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 they're, they're pushed in, in the other direction due to their worldview. But another one is called the familiarity backfire effect. In this is where so for for starters, uh, people always believe that. Um, the more the familiar information, the more true it seems. And this is a very robust finding, and this is a very scary finding for, for the internet as well. The more you're exposed to information, the more you're likely to believe it to be true. Um, however, um, the, the, this idea was that just by repeating the misconception within the retraction is going to boost familiarity so that you're going to believe it more. And this is the one that I've been focusing on. And I have yet to, to find it. Like, if you actually look in the literature, it's, it leads back to this citation trail. Like, everyone's citing other, other people, and it, it does come back to this 2007 paper. But, but there, it's actually an unpublished manuscript that they're referring to of their own work that was never published. Secondly, 
the whole experiment is about vaccines. So this is like an, an, a really emotive topic that's likely to promote a worldview backfire effect anyway. So you're not going to be measuring this other thing of familiarity. Um, what we can find is as long as the misconception is clearly paired with that retraction, you're fine. But you're, 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 you know, it might not be sustained over time, but at the very least, you're going to be. It's going to make the um, belief reduce in the right direction. So that's positive again. Good news. Yeah. So, so I think the the earlier history of this idea of what can go wrong with corrections dates back to television news in the 1990s, when a news organization would fact check a candidate's ad by running the candidate's ad all by itself on the screen, full screen, with no provisos, just here's the whole ad. And then the ad would finish, and then they'd start talking about what was wrong with it. Well, it turns out, if you spend 30 seconds or a minute of your news broadcast rebroadcasting a false political ad, people come to associate that false claim with the news and think it's true. So under very bounded conditions, we can see these sort of reproduction effects. But as you say, if if we are careful in the correction, if we produce strong corrections that are clearly associated with the falsehoods, we actually tend to have effects. It's just discouraging if you're the one who made up the claim in the first place to see how small these effects are, to see how little we can sway people in either direction. President Eisenhower, in, in his farewell speech, warned the American public and the world of the danger of the military-industrial complex. And part of that warning included that they, that they would alter the science. And the first example of uh, the, the importance and validity of President Eisenhower's warning is the assassination of President Kennedy. The, uh, the cover story, the cover-up story, for that conspiracy was that it was a lone assassin. And that is, is obviously wrong. And now even the New York Times is admitting that it was a conspiracy, not a lone assassin. The, current, the best current example I can think of for the validity and importance of President Eisenhower's warning is the problem of elections in the United States. In the, in elections in the United States are covered by news media and professionals, you know, social scientists, with uh, exit polls. It's a science. It's statistics. Um, when the exit polls in the United States of America show fraud on a massive scale, and in the most uh, the most massive scale yet uh, to this date was in the Democratic primary of the 2016 presidential election. The exit polls show massive fraud. Bernie Sanders was the clear winner of the primaries, in the Democratic primaries. The exit polls, in terms of adjusting the science, the, the, the calling the unadjusted exit polls fake news, um, the exit polls, uh, the exit pollsters, pollsters themselves are required to adjust the exit polls as they are produced in, in the normal scientific manner to conform to the report, reported result on the theory that exit polls, uh, there can't be fraud in elections in the United States, so they, they have to adjust the polls to reflect that. And I'd, I'd appreciate your thoughts on this. The, the, the truth, the science, what the science says, and, and the, what we do as a, as a nation to cover up and call it fake news that our elections are stolen. So I think that the question is illustrative of a, a larger point, and that is that perhaps in part because of the technologies that are available and the access to uh, diverse communities of beliefs, we are experiencing a, a crisis of faith in the institutions that produce and disseminate knowledge. As a, as a country, this is a, pro a, a very important challenge that we're facing. 
Um, so the question, for example, about polling and polling adjustments. These kinds of questions are typically, have been raised over multiple elections, and typically it is that they're raised by the side that didn't get the outcome they want, which creates an interesting question about the motivations for the questions about the polling. So in 2012, there was an organization that was purporting to correct the corrected polls because they claimed that the polls were all biased against the Republicans and that if you corrected them, you would find that in fact Romney was assured a win in the election. Now, no reputable polling agency would agree to this and as soon as the election was over, the site disappeared and the people responsible for those arguments said, oh, guess we were wrong. But, uh, and I would say in 2016, uh, I, I actually don't know anything about the Sanders exit polling, so I'm not gonna comment on that, but I would say in 2016, there was a, quite a controversy over the polling data leading up to that election because a bunch of polling companies were saying, well, yeah, we know Clinton's got this in the bag, and they were very critical of 538's prediction saying, oh, you know, it's actually close. Like it's, we, we aren't going to say that it's 98. And just he days- He lowered it to like 60, yeah, he 60. Was, he still was calling it. For, he was still calling it. For, for, but it, yes, around there, 65, 70% maybe. But just a few days before the election, he was being ridiculed yes. by some of these polling houses saying, Indeed. Well, we'll see, you know, after election day, we can all stop worrying about this. So polling is complicated, and we have to put our faith in others who know more about the polling process that we do. And it turns out that's really uncomfortable. Like, I, especially if the outcomes are incompatible with how we understand the world. If we are in a community where everyone that we talk to about the the political situation on a regular basis, the people who, who see the world we do, they say, there's gotta be something wrong with these polls. It's very difficult to say, all right, well, this polling system is really complicated and I'm just gonna have to take it on faith that these individuals know what they're doing. Uh, but, but like climate science, I have to defer to the expertise of people like Nate Silver at 538, right? These are people who know a whole lot more about how to conduct polls, how to adjust polls, how to weight the data that you get so that you end up with results that accurately reflect the kinds of outcomes that you can expect to see in an election. About your comment earlier about uh, not being able to educate our way to truth, and I'm wondering if there's ways to pick out a piece, say, the source of information and educate about sources. I actually have hope that education will work, so I, I, I'm actually pro, pro education, especially considering that in all my, so I always use real world um, stimuli in my, um, real world misinformation, real, uh, real world facts, and I've been like incredibly surprised um, and pleasantly surprised with the ability like, you know, who knows if the people are actually like reading, like it, my, my experiments are often extremely artificial in that like I have a captive audience, they are sitting down, they're reading, oh, this is true, this is false. It's, but I, I don't think the real world necessarily works like that. People are skimming and they're not really paying attention. But at least like if people pay attention in, in I've, I think that fact checking really works. I think that um, if people are presented with the good information, they generally update their beliefs. So um, I think things like media liter literacy and also like technological digital literacy are really important. Um, I have hope for all these things, but do you wanna? I, I just wanted to weigh in on that too. I, I agree that I, I think all of us up here, college professors probably, you know, <clears throat> think education is a good thing, and I think it can work, and, and I agree with you that that digital literacy and media literacy are actually absolutely really important. I mean, just knowing about, for example, the personalization of the internet is important for people to understand, to understand how the economy of knowledge really works these days. But uh, another thing we can educate for besides uh, 
giving people information and facts is we can also educate people for having certain sorts of attitudes. Um, psychological attitudes uh, can come in a variety of types, but one interesting set is what we might call epistemic attitudes, attitudes that we can have towards sources of information, towards knowledge. Uh, so an attitude like open-mindedness or intellectual humility or those sorts of things, an attitude of intellectual perseverance, those sorts of attitudes are sort of things that we also try to get across to our students. And, and <clears throat> those attitudes are really crucial to cultivate, I think, in a population, in a democratic society. If, to the extent to which citizens begin to, uh, are, to the extent to which they're, let's say, more closed-minded, uh, to the extent to which they tend to think that they have nothing to learn from people from the other side, that is sort of intellectually arrogant, to that extent, um, they're going to be more hostile to updating their beliefs in the face of evidence. So sometimes I think focusing on just whether how we, you know, the information that we pass on, the corrections, that's super important. But also we, we don't want to just think about that. We also want to think about how we cultivate attitudes, psychological attitudes, that will make us receptive to those corrections um, without falling into gullibility, as you pointed out earlier. All right, so I'm going to make three points. The first, lest you think that I'm just super pessimistic and depressed all the time. That's only about half the time when I'm thinking about this stuff. I do think that education can make a difference. Um, there, there have been a great many studies showing that fact-checking exposure to corrective information helps. It just doesn't change that much. Um, another source of, of hope for me, and this, this finding uh, is under review, so maybe I'm wrong, but my interpretation of this data, I collected data in 2012 and in 2016 across the course of the election, talking to the same group of Americans three times, asking them about their use of, among other things, social media, and about their beliefs around some political issues. In 2012, I was focused in their beliefs about candidates. There were a set of falsehoods that were circulating around both candidates. In 2016, I was focusing on campaign issues, things like climate change, the Affordable Care Act, the role of immigration policy in the U.S. and how many people were coming in and going out of the country. So in 2012, I found that people, the more often people used social media, the more likely they were to believe falsehoods about Obama. Small, small effect, tiny increase. A little discouraging, but not terribly surprising. More surprising, though, was in 2016, I found that the more people used Facebook compared to other social media platforms, the more accurate their beliefs were. That is, the frequency of use of social media platforms, if you were using Facebook, you were a heavy Facebook user was significantly more accurate than a heavy user of other social media. These are still tiny effects, right? We're talking about of the four or five, uh, I guess it was, I think in this model it was four factual questions. We saw like a half point movement in terms of accuracy, so tiny effects. But my point is that there are opportunities, even in an environment like Facebook, which has all kinds of problems as a tool for promoting education and political engagement, you can see some improvements. But there are important limits. The thing that I'm railing against is the sense that the reason people hold false beliefs is because they don't know any better. It's not that simple. You can't expect to just the newspapers during the 2016 election took the following approach to correcting falsehoods. It's not true. No, really, it's not true. Would you listen to me? I swear, it's not true. This is not going to work. Right? Just yelling louder and louder at your audience, hey, stop being dumb, is not going to persuade them. It's not going to promote accuracy. I think we need to take more <laughs> nuanced approaches. That's my argument. Um, and one other aspect of the limits, so I've experimented with tools for digitally correcting misinformation. What if we were to embed in the news that you encounter online corrections in real time versus encountering the corrections after the fact? Would be great, right? Seems like the right thing to do, stem it, you know, fix it right at the source. Unfortunately, what I found in the first study, this was back in 2011 that we collected these data, when you 
put the correction in real time right there embedded in the story, it only worked for the people who were inclined to doubt the claim in the first place. The people who were inclined to believe the falsehood, a falsehood that I made up, by the way, there was no prior evidence for this, were very skeptical of the incorrection, and basically it made no difference. In a more recent iteration, data collected in the spring of this year, we pitted a variety of different kinds of fact checks posted on social media messages. So what if we have a fact check that says, hey, you know, your peers are saying there's something wrong with this message. What if you have one that says, fact checkers have reviewed this and say it's not true. What if you have one that says, this is a site that has self-disclosed that they're all about sharing hoaxes and satire. Well, if you think about it for a moment, you're probably gonna to gravitate to the last one. And you'd be right, that's the one that made a difference. When you tell people, hey, this claim comes from a place that readily admits they make stuff up, people were willing to say, okay, yeah, maybe it's not true. But the other ones didn't make any difference. Just telling someone, fact checkers have reviewed this, no significant difference to not having any kind of flag on it at all. Telling them that their peers said, this is kind of suspicious, didn't make a difference. So yes, it can work, but there are limits. And the last thing I want to talk about is this notion of epistemics and, and how people think about the world and how they decide what's true. This is where I think education actually could make a difference. It's, it's actually a more sort of, it's a sideways approach to this problem. Instead of focusing on this thing you believe is false, instead, let's talk about how you decide what is true. If you say that it's really important to weigh the evidence, you're more likely to reject conspiracy theories and to answer accurately than if you say, I trust my gut. All of us rely on a mix of intuition and reason to achieve our decisions to, to know what's true. But the people who weigh more heavily the evidence, who say it's important for my beliefs to align with the evidence that is out there, these people tend to do better at avoiding the pitfalls, avoiding the kinds of false claims that they might otherwise be tricked into. So if we can promote education in that sense, I think we have a real chance. But that's a long-term goal. Like, I mean, right now I say, talk to your friends. You know, if someone says they don't believe something that you know is true, it's tempting to kind of like turn your head and go try and talk to someone else. But you know what? There's actually value in saying, well, let's have that conversation because there's, I'm not saying you're going to convince them. Remember that, that denominator neglect? You're just one person. They've got hundreds of thousands of people who agree with them. But if enough of us do it, if enough people in your social network are encountering, you know, if, if everyone I encounter is saying, hey, every time you say that, I'm not sure that's right. That can make a difference. Yeah, we might summarize that. I, I might summarize that in a self-serving philosophical way as saying everyone should take epistemology. <laughs> we should teach epist epistemology in kindergarten. I'm actually not really joking about that. I think this is an indirect, uh, it's exactly the sort of thing that I had in mind. Uh, we need to, <clears throat> you know, there is, a, there is something to be said for engaging uh, these sorts of concepts very early on. And of course we do that in all sorts of educational settings. But, <clears throat> you know, really bringing it to the fore, I think, uh, is uh, worth studying, worth thinking about. Just a final comment on that I thought it was a really good point, the limits of, of education. Um, just because one of the most robust findings is that corrections don't last. In, you know, as you measure them over time, they don't actually stick. And I think uh, we've been talking a lot about you know, biases and motivated reasoning, but there's one element that I've spent a lot of time researching, which is like the processes of memory. And really, what, what you believe to be true is what you remember to be true. And sometimes we're really vulnerable to these like traditional memory pitfalls. And in that particular case, repetition, so literally repeating the correction does, is, is effective. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, again, it, 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 the whole time thing, I think we have to be very aware of. I want to put in a plug really quickly for, there's a session at 3.30 on educational responses and the limits and possibilities um, that I'm leading. Um,
I tend to be more pessimistic these days too, so I'm very happy to hear that you do think that there are possibilities for this, and so if, for those of you who are interested in, in exploring this more, I hope you'll be there. Um, just to change the conversation slightly uh, to what you were saying about technology and whether it's intrin something intrinsic in the technology or just what we do with it, I'm interested in how our embodied relationships to our uh, mobile devices may change how we um, interact with or kind of how we mediate the information that we come across. Just anecdotally, I know with myself, I feel like I tend to have my critical thinking skills are maybe not as sharp when I'm just scrolling on my phone. And I don't know if this is because there's actually something in my physical relationship to this device that kind of has this sort of passive or numbing effect on how I absorb things, or if it's just the fact that Twitter and Facebook are just more um, conveniently there all the time. But I was wondering if any of you have had done any studies where you've looked at differences in, in whether people are on mobile devices or on um, desktops or things like that. I, I haven't, and I think the difference between offline and online learning is like a really interesting feel hit for you. I, I mean, I was there, there was a science paper a couple of years ago which was super interesting about how um, they think like the ability to Google or um, your connection with the internet has actually changed how we remember things. It's changed like your memory process. They said that you're less likely to actually remember things that you know you can refind again online. And so I think that there was a really interesting kind of shift to think, wow, this is really, this is changing how we function. I, I am a little skeptical of the uh, handheld versus laptop experience, for example. I, I think that we know people encounter social media in a way that's different than their encounters with other channels for getting the news, for instance. Um, Facebook has said that the posts that are shared on Facebook, on average, get six seconds of attention. So if you're typically spending six seconds viewing a post, it's not surprising that you're um, processing of the information in that post is going to be fairly thin. Like, I don't know about you, I can't do a lot in six seconds. It's about enough time to read some of the words. Um, and so I think that the habits that we form, the, the, to the extent that our use of social media is uh, habitual brain candy, you know, we're scrolling through looking for the thing that makes us feel good. And while we're going, we're seeing other stuff. Stuff that might not make us feel good, but still grabs our attention because we are keyed in to danger. So you're scrolling through looking for something to make you feel better because oh, politics these days, they got me down. And in between those things that make you feel better, you're actually getting exposed to reinforcement of the negative feelings. And so I, th I think that this is back into this notion of our tribes and our emotions and the, the ways that social media are hitting on a bunch of buttons at once. The, our social connections make it more likely that we're going to be exposed to diverse points of view because the things that get shared, we're less attentive to the political cues and more attentive to, hey, are our friends looking at them? So there's something good about that. But at the same time, the, the, when you encounter political context, content in a context that is highly emotive and full of tribal indicators and, and like tuning you into your group, I think that it's potentially going to, um, there's going to be some complex interaction there. I actually think that the embodied point um, is, is super important. Uh, I think that the fact that technology is now gravitating inwards, as we might say, getting closer and closer to ourselves, uh, uh, is incredibly important because it means that the Internet of Things is actually become more like the Internet of us. And one way to think about that would be, a, you know, just think, I'm a philosopher, so I don't deal with real data. I, I just make stuff up. Um, I'm sort of a fake news of academic disciplines, right? Um, uh, so here's something, though, that uh, a thought experiment, which is that Imagine that you had your smartphone miniaturized to such an extent that it was connected directly to your neural net in your brain. Um, it won't shock you to realize that there are actually people who, there are labs that are thinking about that sort of possibility. Uh, there's such incredible engineering challenges to that that it's probably not likely to happen. 
But it is interesting to think about what would society would be like if we could access the internet at the speed of thought. Um, how that would, in fact, perhaps lead directly to how much offloading, you know, the offloading that Google, Google, Google knowing is, really. I mean, Google knowing is, when I Google know something, I, I Google know all sorts of things just because I have my, my phone right here in my pocket now. I feel I know all sorts of things that I, I, I actually probably don't individually know at all because of the, the accessibility of it. But if that, the, the, the speed at which I can access things and the intimacy by which I can come, I can interact with that information does matter. That's what I mean about the importance of embodiment. And that's what, when we reflect on that sort of thought experiment of what it would be like when it was maximally intimate, when it was connected, you know, by thought command. Um, I think at that point, we'd begin to think of it as um, Google knowing would become like another sense. Uh, it would be something that if you took it away, right after we had it for a generation or so, those implants, we took that away, it would be as if we had gone blind. And in a way, we're already sort of there now. Take my phone away, I, I feel 100% dumber. Um, so I think embodiment is actually really important. Heidegger talked about technologies that were ready at hand. That is, things that were, were comfortable, we were comfortable in their use, they, their function seemed to be an extension of our own body. I think we're there already. We don't actually need thought experiments. I, can I just say one quick thing about, so this ready, ready at handedness thing, I think is really critically important, and I think it's a more important distinction than the physical form factor. I think that this is the key. I don't want to focus on handheld versus laptop. It's how, how much is it, when we think of a question, does Google come to mind before the answer, before we actually do our own, own inquiry? That habitualness is what is transforming how we interact with the world, not so much the technology. Gotcha.